righty. Uh, welcome back to season two of the podcast. This is very exciting. I'm happy to be back in here. Uh, as of today, it's like the first week of September, so I haven't been back in here since May. Um, so very excited to be bringing back some new some new episodes. It's been a minute. Um, joining me today is Ashley Corin. Hello, those listening. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Ashley is an alumna from 2007 uh, who currently works as the head of education for the Women's History Initiative at the nascent uh, Smithsonian (laughs) Women's History Museum. Is that that fair to say? I think that is very fair to say. Yeah, well, we'll touch on that more later on. but yeah, Ashley's giving a, a lecture tonight, which we're very excited. So I'm I'm very fortunate to be able to have a conjure into doing this podcast. Um, no worries, so. no worries, no conjuring involved. Happy to do it. <laughs> Happy to hear my voice. Oh yeah, isn't everybody? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, just to start, I'm, um, we've obviously talked about this, but I'm I'm curious about how you got interested in museums, um, and how that tied into obviously you were museum intern. Um, and how that experience shaped your your future career. Of course. Um, Before we jump in, I just want to say briefly, um, uh, for those who don't know, we are in uh, Pettigrew Hall on campus. And I'm having the craziest flashback right now, Peter, because (laughs) one of the many jobs, of course, Batesy's, we have various jobs on campus. Always too busy. Yeah, Yeah. always too busy. Was actually running um, the box office for Schaefer Theater. And then- For part time, I worked for Michael Reedy, and so I remember oh. the classroom we passed by. I'm pretty sure I cleaned that classroom for Michael Reedy at some point wow. during <laughs> my career in this building. Michael Reedy is still here. Shut the front door. Yeah, he's he's in this building probably right now. Oh, what? So when we're done here, I'll show you where his office oh, is because you can gosh. probably find Michael Reedy. Oh, well, I'm just first of all, I'm just really happy to be here chatting with you, Peter, <laughs> and and and. You know, just being here back on campus has just been absolutely fabulous. But it is pretty freaking weird to be in Pettigrew, <laughs> which is where I spent a lot of my time. Um, but back to back to your question. Um, it's, it's so funny. Uh, you know, before coming to Bates, I thought I was going to become a lawyer, mm-hmm. like straight up. Like I was like, hey, we're going to major in politics and, yeah, and yeah. then I'll go to law school. Um And then that magical thing happened where I took one class in art and visual culture and Mm -hmm. that was it like that was that was it for me um and it's really funny because you know i went to museums as a kid you know class field trips and stuff but i never really had um a personal relationship with museums and, and art history and sort of through the coursework and sort of through you know meeting folks um, in the department, um, I really started to understand that a museum was just a place to see old stuff. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. There's so much more that happens in a museum. A museum is an opportunity, a space where you can have dialogue and learn about new cultures um, and also learn about yourself. And so what's great is sort of pairing my sort of intellectual work in the classroom with sort of you know, the work I was doing at the museum, Mm -hmm. it really felt like I was able to sort of tie my interests in history, in visual culture, but to actually have something tangible, right? The museum internship gave me something tangible um, to work with, right? Through thinking about record keeping or sort of thinking about um, exhibitions. Like what Mm -hmm. a wonderful way to be able to communicate different messages and ideas and and controversial points yeah um through this particular institution through the use of museum objects yeah and I, i've probably mentioned on here before that i think my biggest regret as a student was not doing a museum no, internship no. <laughs> um so for for students listening I, I highly encourage you to go and and check that out um but yeah i mean obviously the the internship and, and the class were were pulling you towards museums. Um, But I'm kind of curious to hear, I mean, we've talked about this, so I know it's interesting. (laughs) Um, Your kind of fascinating path to where you are, where you are now, um, both kind of, you know, during and then after Bates and kind of where that took you. Yeah. So um, I'm the first person in my family to get a four-year degree. Um, So majoring in our history was not um, fully embraced Mm -hmm. (laughs) when I, when I announced um, my intention to declare and I think they're probably sympathetic. Yeah, listeners. exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
And so um, one of the reasons why I was so interested in the field was I just felt like I could do anything with it, mm. right? The whole idea of sort of studying visual culture, studying history, studying people and identity and all of those things, it just sort of felt, you know, I could, I'll could, i figure this out, right? <laughs> you can do anything yeah. after this. Um, but I think, you know, having the museum internship really sort of solidified, like, what do, what do I actually want to do in a museum space? So at the mm. time, I thought I wanted to be a registrar. And so I graduated from college in 2007, um, tried to do what a lot of people do was move to New York City <laughs> to find that museum or gallery job. Yeah. And um, in the meantime, I briefly was at um, Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston working mm. in visitor services. So basically telling people not to touch things um, and, and introducing them to objects on the floor, which was super fun. It's an important job. Yeah, it's an yeah. important job. Yeah. Um, and learning more about sort of the front facing work in mm -hmm. museums. And so at the time I wanted to be a registrar, I was like, I am not a front facing person. This is kind of like a reoccurring theme in my life, Peter, is like, I'll be hmm. like, oh, I want to be this thing yeah. because I don't like it. And then I end up doing exactly. Yeah, it's like getting pulled right into it. Yeah, yeah then I yeah. just get pulled into it. Um, and so I couldn't find a job in New York. And, and because of my networks and because of just my lack of just knowledge about the field, I didn't realize that a big part of it is just knowing people. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. who you know and you know, being able to do the unpaid internships. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and thankfully, my internship at, at the museum was not unpaid, which was <laughs> fabulous. But, you know, there's so much for people who are not sort of raised in going to museums or sort of well immersed in the art field. It's kind of hard to sort of get your footing mm. um, when you're sort of an outsider sort of coming in. Um, so it took me a while to figure out, OK, this is actually a little harder than I thought it was going to be. Mm. And so I uh, I applied for a bunch of jobs and I almost got one in a really awesome gallery um, in New York, but the pay was just absolutely lousy. <laughs> it was yeah. awful. Um, yeah. And so I was also applying for jobs in publishing because I really, you know, if you're not an art nerd, you're a book nerd, right? Like yeah. it's like, you know, or you're both. That's like a really heavy Venn diagram, <laughs> I think. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I ended up uh, working for Penguin Books with this idea that I would go to grad school afterwards um, in art history. And I ended up doing that. Um, but, you know, I really, at, you know, now being, you know, being almost over 15 years, mm -hmm. um, I really probably should have worked a little bit more <laughs> um, because, you know, things evolve. Things shift when you sort of experience yeah, different yeah. things. Um, your tastes tend to change. But I was briefly in an art history master's program, realized that the academic side was not necessarily for me and that mm. I really was interested in sort of the practical um, less so much you know the sort of the scholarly but more how do I talk to my mom about what it is that I do you know that yeah. became increasingly important to me it's like how do I that's an interesting way to phrase that yeah like yeah. how do I explain to members of my family who don't regularly go to museums who are not really engaged in art how do I make something exciting and accessible to them, which I felt I was not mm. necessarily getting in an art history master's program. Mm. And so I was like, well, this this setting is not for me, but at the time I need a job. And yes. so um, <laughs> I actually worked in the fine arts library for a few semesters, which really sort of solidified some of the things that I really loved, which was talking about art, talking about visual culture, but actually having a way to help others get really excited about these things mm. too as well through engaging with library patrons and, and helping them with their research topics yeah. um, and getting them excited about history. So I ended up going to um, library science school in Boston and, and decided to major in archives management um, because it was a really great sort of blend yeah. of the history, but then sort of objects. Um, and that was at Simmons, right? Yeah, that's yeah. at Simmons. So very prestigious program, people who don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and it was fun. It was really fun to be in Boston. Yeah. Um, because I was able to sort of do internships. Like I did an internship at the Boston Public Library in their prints and photography oh, department. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I was still able to really still yeah, engage yeah, yeah. In, in art and art objects, even sort of pursuing the sort of library science degree. And then, you know, afterwards, like a lot of folks, you know, you kind of have to move mm -hmm. to, to get a job. And so I was briefly at... West Virginia University, go Mountaineers. Um, <laughs> and then finally a job opened up at the University of Maryland um, in special collections, leading education for the entire department. Mm -hmm. So they wanted someone to come in who could really 
define what an education program was, but through the lens of special collections. So how do we get folks on campus to incorporate special collections into their classrooms? Yeah. How do we work with researchers um, to encourage them to use special collections in their work? How do we create displays and exhibits and all sorts of things to get people really jazzed about it? And so um, it was so fun. Like I basically just got to just be in people's faces and be like, hey, yeah. do you want to see something old? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, have, yeah. we have this thing. Do you want to come see it? One of the most oh. fun things you can do. Yeah, exactly. Museum, yeah. And and we've talked about this too, Peter, this idea of it's it's very frustrating and it's hard, but getting people to be more open-minded about how objects can actually supplement the work that they're doing in the classroom and through their research yes. is yeah. really fun, right? Like me mm-hmm. being able to explain to, um, and I mix this up, so just... <laughs> Listeners, very, very. I, I mix up the people who study um, plants and the people who study um, insects. It's like a very similar. It's like, oh, it's like yeah. etymology or et- a, It's like uh, we are not um, yeah. <laughs> STEM majors. <laughs> no, we're not. So apologies to okay. yeah but insect in, experts. Exactly insect yeah. experts. But we had these really amazing field notes in our collection from mm. like decades and decades and decades ago of, of researchers that had been on campus, um, and I was like, you know, wouldn't it be really cool to work with a professor to sort of talk about um, how people collected information in the field versus collecting in the digital age, like actually having a really interesting conversation about sort of field study yeah. and like how that and the evolution of field study mm-hmm. um, and using archival collections to sort of have yeah, those great. those really big conversations and using archival collections to help students understand feminist art through looking at student organizations on campus in the 1970s. Mm. Um, and so I was doing all this stuff and having a good time and a friend of mine um, was like, hey, there's this job that just opened up at the Smithsonian. They're starting this new American Women's History Initiative. Um, the portrait gallery has this opening for mm-hmm. a content and interpretation curator. You should apply for it. And I was like, why? Like, I haven't been in a museum in 10 years, right? And mm-hmm. and a part of me was just sort of having that anxiety of having to go through all of that again. And, of course. And, like, yeah. feeling like an outsider again. And she said, no. She said, you need to get your stuff together. You <laughs> need to apply. Um, and what's great, too, is that, you know, you have to take a risk. But I yeah. think also what people don't understand about the GLAM field, for those who are unaware, GLAM stands for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, is that a lot of the skills are transferable between all those different areas. Mm-hmm. So the work that I do at the at when I was at the Portrait Gallery and now at the National Women's History Museum, I have to be a really great researcher. Yeah, I have to be great at building relationships. I have to be really creative, flexible, nimble. Yeah. Um, Sounds familiar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Willing yeah. to pick up new skills, willing to, you know... So it's just it's 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 been a really interesting journey. And it's one of those things where like 10 years ago, I was like, I'll never be back in museums like I'm going to be in libraries forever. See, I'm telling you, Peter, it's like a weird yeah. thing where, I'm, where yeah. I think I know what's going mm-hmm. to happen. And I don't I have no freaking clue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, like that was my my parents joke growing up growing up was always uh if you want to make god laugh tell him what you're doing tomorrow yes exactly and i think that that's that's kind of one of the big lessons to take from that i think is you have to try new things because you never exactly. really know where you're going to end up exactly um but yeah so now you're at the the women's history initiative yeah. working on that yeah. um i'm really curious if you could describe kind of what what that is sure. um because it's uh you know the women's american women's history museum is you know a museum without currently without a space without a a director so i'm kind of curious what that's like to work in that kind of nascent environment yeah so it's been really interesting because i was there when it was an initiative and in 2021 it became you know congress mandated this museum um so i've been i've been there like literally during the evolution okay um, yeah of this of this space and um it's uh it's really interesting being at the very beginning of something mm. when something is being formed i was i think we were talking the other day it kind of feels like i'm in a startup in a lot of ways <laughs> um because it's just everyone's kind of scrambling and you know we're kind of just building it as we go along and yeah. figuring it out as we go along but it's really exciting to be a part of um a moment when you and your colleagues are a part of or at least attempting to sort of build the foundation for something in the future yeah, right? it's really cool yeah. to be able to be a part of those initial conversations, um, to be testing out some new things. Right, my yeah. team and I test out different types of educational resources and programs, and sometimes it works, and sometimes <laughs> it does not. Um, yes, but it's kind of cool to be in a situation where um, 
not necessarily the, there are boundaries of course but we have a, a little bit more room to experiment because yeah, right. there's no building. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, That'll and, do it. Yeah. And two, we're just sort of testing out like what works. So when this museum is finally formed and there's a building and people are in it, um, you know, we'll be a part of that process of figuring out like what the museum should represent and what should be in it and what should we be talking about yeah. and, and who should be a part of it. Yeah. So. Cause I know, I mean like one of the challenges that, you know, is kind of common in museums is sort of, I want to do this thing, mm -hmm. but you know, we have a specific space, you know, we're limited to what we exactly. can put on these walls, what we can do in this. So it's very interesting and different to have this other exactly. end of like, well, we can do almost anything. Yeah. Like what, you know, how to draw something from that. That's yeah. like a totally different challenge. Yeah. And it's hard too, because, um, because I don't have a collection I actually work alongside right like dozens of my colleagues at the Smithsonian and at other institutions too as well. Like I have partnerships um, with the DC Public Library. We're mm -hmm. now, right now we're working with the Phillips Collection. We have a partnership with the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Oh, wow. um, and so it, it's also hard to limit yourself because you have to be like, okay, we can't do everything with everybody. I really want to because it's really fun and cool. Yeah. Um, and collaboration is always a good time. But it's also trying to figure out like what is our niche because at the same time, while this museum is being built and it's fabulous and it's wonderful, there are also other sort of women and girls serving institutions across the country and in the world. So it's like, yeah. how do we both sort of create our niche, sort of create our spot? And also, you know, thinking about women's history, um, be a part of a network, mm -hmm. be a part of literally a sisterhood of other right. institutions that are doing similar things. And how can we like support one another? But then, you know, what do we, what can we provide that's a little bit different than everybody else? Yeah, that's a fascinating challenge. Yeah, um, I'm really intrigued to see where it goes. Me I mean, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's going to be something really special. Yeah. But uh, as a as a kind of a final final question here, I'm going to turn a question back on you that you were asking us and in the interns this morning. Okay. Okay. Which was a, f a favorite woman from history. This is literally like asking me. It's like it's this is like you know what is that biblical story where we have to like choose one of the oh uh, 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 the uh, uh, Solomon and like yes, the two I can't yeah. do it. Um, <laughs> there's just there's just too many. Um, but uh, I think um, one of the things that I'm working on right now, which is so much fun, um, and I think I was telling you about this last night, is um, because you know. I have an expansive view of the work that we do. Right. I We do everything from video, social media, lesson plans, videos, like we do all of that stuff. Yeah. And, and one of the things, one of the things I love doing is working with Side Door, which is the Smithsonian's podcast. Um, and Give so it a I, listen. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and I love pitching them episodes. And basically I pitch them episodes of things that like, I think would work better in a podcast format, mm, mm -hmm. right? So instead of me building a lesson plan or a teaching poster, like actually this lends itself where to, well to this particular type of storytelling. Yeah, right. Um, so one of the things we're working on right now is um, this episode on Maggie Kuhn, mm -hmm. who um, is no longer with us, but was this spunky, <laughs> like sassy, like activist who um, along with other folks helped found something called the Gray Panthers. Oh, yes. yes. We talked about this. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, of course, inspired by the Black Panthers, um, the Gray Panthers was basically one of the sort of first major um, movements uh, focused on the elderly and focused on advocacy and sort of focused on this idea of, you know, when you turn a certain age, people start treating you, stop treating you like a person. <laughs> um, you become invisible and you, yeah. you know, and so they were like, no, like just because I'm a certain age doesn't mean that you get to treat me this way or that I don't get to have a say in how I live. Um, and so Maggie and these folks um, have really been sort of working for decades. I mean, the Grey Panther still continues, but they started in the 1970s, sort of really pushing back on what happens, how society treats us when we turn a certain age. And I love yeah. the fact that it doesn't matter how old you are or where you are or what you do, like this idea that you still matter. And I love yeah. sort of thinking about Maggie's story as an example of that. Because yeah. we have so many examples of when people get older, you know, we tell them, you know, sit down, grandma. Coming a burden. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's like, you know, we live in a society where we tell people that, you know, once you hit a certain age, you're no longer useful in the workforce. Or... Yep. 
um, you're no longer beautiful or mm-hmm. you're no longer worth spending money on. Um, and so I, I just really love the fact that, you know, when you sort of really take the time to learn women's history, you sort of realize that these people have been here for a very long time. And yeah. the work that they've done have actually affected the way that we think about elder care now in the 21st century. Yeah. So. And also, I mean, Grey Panthers. Like, yeah. <laughs> top five organizational name. That's awesome. That's why I love history too. Yeah. Like, I've been trying to pitch for them the Lesbian Avengers. They were like a <laughs> um, a multi artist group, mostly because they're called the Lesbian Avengers. Well, yeah. And like for the past year, I've been like, hey, so here's my idea of pitches. I'm gonna like, slip in the Lesbian Avengers one last time. Yeah, just see, keep pushing that just one. Keep in, pushing yeah. to see if like it it happens someday. I don't so. know a podcast on the gray panthers and the lesbian avengers is pretty funny. <laughs> doesn't that sound wonderful that sounds exciting yeah this is like why i do my job is that i get to do stuff <laughs> like this yeah wow well hey thank you Don't so thank much you. for doing this uh it's such a blast to have alumni uh appear on here it's something i want to do more often um and i'm very excited to hear your your talk tonight oh thank you apologies thank you. to listeners you will I've already missed it, already attended, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, what was the name of the, the Smithsonian's podcast again? Uh, Side Door. Side Door. So be sure to check out Side Door um, and stay up to date on what's going on with the, the Women's History Museum. Yes, please. Um, our website is www.womenshistory.si.edu. Oh, you got that one. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> You got to get claim on the domain Always there. ready. Always yeah, yeah, ready. yeah. That's beautiful. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Peter.